Uh, hello, my name is Piers Mann. I'm the director of Global Alliances for a US cancer charity. You might wonder uh, um, why I'm in London. Well, we think there's better access to data here is one of the reasons, and data is very important for precision medicine. Um, and it's great to see you here today. Um, if we could just have the first slide, please. I'm going to take five minutes to sort of set us up for what we're talking about. Then our, our illustrious panel will introduce themselves, and they've been asked to give you a main message to get the, sort of the, the debate going. Uh, and then we'll um, uh, settle off to um, uh, basically uh, look forward to engaging you. Because as you can see, we've slightly twisted in our discussions leading up to this panel what we're going to talk about. We want to make it very practical. It's making it happen here. Here is in the United Kingdom. There's lots of talk. Sometimes there's no smoke without fire. We want the fire to happen. That's what the focus of today is. If I can have the first slide, please. So, um, we're, as I said, we're a Silicon Valley cancer charity. That means we focus on data. And the reason we focus on data is effectively this rather frightening statistic. We could, we're in cancer for this one. I could have done it in other areas I've worked before when I was in an industry, such as polygenetic dyslipidemia. The problem is validation. The numbers are really scary. It's very easy to discover a biomarker and believe that it might have a, really, a use with patients in predicting who responds or doesn't to therapy. Proving that is a numbers game. Now, if you take the sort of conventional definition of cancer as a somatic mutation-driven disease, there's at least 250 different genes that can be involved, multiple alleles of those genes as well, but most of them are only mutated in about 1% of patients. The problem is just pure maths. If you assume that you've got a minor or a moderate effect uh, 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 biomarker, you're going to need a cohort. And you can argue about the size of that cohort, but for just illustration purposes, we took 250, which is roughly speaking a sort of a phase two precision medicine, a phase three precision medicine trial in cancer. How many patients do you need? But not done as the obvious thing, 250. How big is the country that you need to recruit in? So those numbers there are the millions of head of population you need given incidence and biomarker frequency to find that cohort. And you could do this in any disease, cystic fibrosis, Parkinson's, anything where there's a genetic illustration, you'll get the same problem. You can see in something like lung, which is a big cancer, number three by incidence, that you know, we can get to the, sort of the, the five genes that are mutated in more than 20% uh, of patients in a population that's about Newcastle. But if you get down to the 1% stuff, we need the whole of the UK. At the moment, we only enroll 23% of patients into trial. So when well, I mean whole of UK, that's uh, what, what, what we need. Now, if you go around the far side, liver, I, mean, I imagine we all know people who've died of liver cancer. The numbers are truly frightening. To get to the 1% mutation levels, we need every patient in Europe to be in a single registry and in a single cohort. So that's my challenge to do us today, is how do we drive validation and uptake? Because discoveries kind of happened. So we have the next slide. So this is just, um, you know, we spend a lot of time working with uh, leaders in, across Europe and America in doing this. And I just wanted to bring alive some of the things that are in the last two years working in America that have come to me. Three um, case studies, one from INCA, the Institut National de Cancer in, 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 in France, which runs a national molecular pathology program and has done so since 2006. Uh, the second, which is Orion, which is the Moffat-led center with about 50,000 incident cancers a year going through their precision medicine system. Uh, and the third is Intermountain Health, which is the uh, Utah-based um, uh, single integrated payer provider in the US who gets all the Mormons into their own database, just to give you a sense of what that, that's the scale. And if you step back and go, why these people are places where pharma want to do the deals? So the last session, if you were here, was about how you get partnerships. If you're thinking as a healthcare system, how do you get partnerships? Make yourself more attractive than these people would be a good rule of thumb. And what do they do? And what have, have they driven their, their, their precision medicine systems? Firstly, it's been led by, by clinicians. They're evangelical about getting better care, both in terms of harm avoidance and better outcomes, to patients now. Not as a research exercise in 20 years' time. The second is they all formally have equality of access uh, to innovation uh, uh, missions. So France, in the Institut National Cancer, the reason they implemented a national molecular pathology program was otherwise they were going to get a postcode lottery. 
Academic centres who understood the technology would switch it on, and if you were the 80% of patients who don't get seen in an academic centre, you wouldn't. Equality of access is important on this. That meant that they could do number three, which is they could give you whole population data. If you do the deal with France, as Pfizer's done, you get them to switch on your biomarkers for phase three across the entire French cancer population. I don't know, that might solve certain recruitment to trial issues, just perhaps. They don't focus, as we continue to do in our academic way, on cohorts. They are whole population and they are continuous. That's difficult to fund. And they've all systematically done one thing. They all top sliced their diagnostic budgets so that the money was found so that for the frontline services, it looks free on the bill. If you're the prescribing doctor ordering the test, it looks free. Of course it isn't, but at least they've got national procurement to solve that. So the barrier to uptake of hiding it in the, uh, the tariff has been taken away. And the final thing that happens is they've created integrated uh, research programs that cover everything from basic research through to clinical research to care quality. There is so much that we can do with the existing drugs we have and the existing therapies we have in using them better and effectively retrofitting precision to them. That's where the cheap wins are going to be. That's how we're going to mobilize patients. That's how we're going to mobilize clinicians to work out that DNA means something other than did not attend. <laughs> and so that, that's my message for you. Know, if you want to make precision medicine happen here, you've got to be more attractive than these systems. And then I would just, just quickly introduce the panel on the next slide. Illustrious people, they'll give you a, a quick biog, and they've got been asked to come up with one thing that they would like to sort of say to you about how to make this happen here when we do the introductions, but a great panel. And just to show you a sense of where the time is going, the last slide, we're going to divide the time across three questions, and I would love your participation. In this room are experts who can help the system work out how to make itself attractive. The panel is what? by eye, 4% of, of the brain power we've got in this room. We want your input to this discussion. So that's where we're headed. Let's go. So, um, introductions. Perhaps you could all introduce yourself, a uh, minute or two, who you are, what, how you've been on this journey, and your, on your main message. Well, I, Let's I, take, I, it, take it by for Neil first. Take it here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Neil Mesher, I am the chief exec for uh, Philips Healthcare. Um, for those that, have you, that you might not know, um, we've been in the healthcare space for 100 years. We're predominantly a diagnostic imaging business. That's where it all started 100 years ago. Um, the conversation over coffee was we made fantastic um, X-ray equipment to produce black and white images, and we now make fantastic equipment to produce black and white images for radiology. <coughs> so, um, but what we do produce, of course, behind that black and white image is a vast array of data, um, a vast array of data. And under our control currently, globally, we've got something like 21 petabytes of imaging data that is available. 21 petabytes of data is enough to genomically sequence the whole of the US three times over. Now, we store that data very, very safely, and that's pretty much what we do with it. So I think that the, 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 the core message I think that we have here is the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity that we have is around the data. That clinical data can form part of the future of precision medicine, but I think it forms about 20% of what the data set might look like. About 30% of that data set may well be the genomics piece, and that's the piece that's getting all the attention at the moment. But there is other data that will also form part of this picture. If you've got people living with long-term conditions, ongoing health monitoring data, which will be part of the future, part of supporting people living with long-term conditions in a home environment and capturing ongoing data from those individuals will also perform part of the future, as well as the environmental data. Now, all these different data sets need to be brought together. Not one of them will exist in a format that can talk to the other. Um, even within clinical data sets, if you take a single patient and we'll take a single patient going through a cancer journey, we know this because we've mapped this, um, a single um, patient in a geography in England will go through 31 different IT systems from screening through to um, uh, discharge, 31 different systems. Those systems do not talk to each other on that simple patient journey and that's assuming there is no complication in that data set. So not only within the existing pathway do we have complexity around the data, there is a huge opportunity to go beyond that, but we don't have a way of uh, currently collating that, that, uh, that data. So I think for me, if you wanted one thing, Pierce, for me, it would be around how do we manage 
that data piece over the coming years, and we need that to really make uh, precision, precision medicine a reality. Thank you, Neil. Hakim. So, good morning. Uh, Hakim Yadi, Chief Executive of the Northern Health Science Alliance. We're an alliance of eight large teaching hospitals and eight medical schools, as well as four academic health science networks across the north of England. We cover the city regions of Lancaster, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, Durham and York. So we cover the whole of the north. And we were established by the chief executives of the teaching hospitals and the medical deans to drive more R&D investment and R&D partnerships with our hospitals because hospitals that conduct more research have better outcomes. And we recognise the opportunity of utilising something I call best of breed, which is being able to access the very best of each of the research areas in the hospitals around a particular problem space that a company, an academic or clinician uh, is working on. So in many of the projects the Northern Health Science Alliance runs with industry partners, we'll have different teams from our institutes, from our hospitals, from our universities, each contributing their own area of expertise to the problem. And I can give some examples later of some of the pro projects we've done in precision medicine. It's called precision medicine because it's not yet medicine. Patients will never really refer to it as precision medicine, it's medicine. And the reason why we're still calling it precision medicine and the reason why we call it digital health is because it's not mainstream and it's not consistent. I certainly don't call it or refer to it as digital banking or I watched a digital movie. It's just I did my banking on my phone and I watched a movie on Netflix. So when it's not consistent and when it's not mainstream, we give it a different title. But we all recognise the future is going to be precision, consistently and mainstream. And the question is, how do we get there and how do we do it here? We've been very good in the UK through organisations like NHS England, the Wellcome Trust, the MRC and all the funding bodies in putting huge amounts of funding into the deep science and deep technologies that we need to be able to do the early stage of precision medicine, identifying the biomarkers, building the cohorts. But I don't think we're yet at the point where we're putting enough investment in the business of precision medicine. So the funding of the research nurses, the funding of the biostaticians, the funding of the trials methodology teams. We are going to need an army of people to be able to deliver precision medicine at scale. And we're not yet there yet in terms of where we're putting the investment. So I'd be really interested in hearing people's views on where we should be putting that investment to try and bring it um, to reality. The 100,000 Genomes Project is a great example of where they're with the 100,000 genomes, looking at the different segments that need to be done, the education, the clinical training, but that's for the whole genome. There are a whole vast array of other ways of delivering precision medicine that doesn't depend uh, on a genome. And back to Piers' question of making here the best place to do it. We often talk in the UK about our USPs, but actually in this industry we have one, a truly unique one, which is the NHS ID number a longitudinal record linked to outcomes that we can really build out precision medicine from. Is our science better than the US? Probably not. Are our companies or venture capital better than anywhere? No. We're probably on par with a third cluster in the world outside of San Francisco and Boston. But what we do have is the NHS and an engine for precision medicine and the ability to link the, to the unique ID number and I think that will be a huge opportunity for us and everyone in the room if we are to make here the best place for precision medicine. Well, good morning. Hi, I'm Chitting Acha. I lead the research um, uh, medical and innovation policy for the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry. That's the industry based here in the UK. Um, but it obviously reflects a range of the uh, biggest research-based pharma uh, globally. And I think what the useful thing uh, I can add to the conversation today is that my own role before I came to ABPI is I worked in global policy roles for both Pfizer and, and Amgen, um, where I was at Amgen, I was at regulatory policy. So I've, I've seen this, this issue and the discussions around precision medicine for um, uh, nearly a decade. Um, and it was preceding that. I mean, this has been a long conversation. Sometimes we call it, in fact, precision medicine is one of the more recent names. Um, it's had many names uh, and many labels to it, but it hasn't made an effect? Absolutely. So good 42 percent, um, even two years ago, so this is probably out of date, about 42 percent of the companies had targeted uh, treatments in their pipeline. But I can say hand on heart, all of them are going to be doing biomarker validation when they're doing uh, target uh, confirmation and, and plans for 
uh, development of, of any of their, their medicines at the minute. Because really what's driving this is, you know, and everybody, we've talked about science this morning, but it seems to be always almost like a ceteris paribus, that yes, there will be science. But actually, it is the science. <laughs> it really is the science. We have been able to understand these things only because there has been progress. That means that we can better now uh, appreciate the human biology that we're trying to talk about and the disease biology that we're trying to address. And that biomarker validation question that Piers raised at the beginning is critical. Um, this is really science in action that needs to be challenged, it needs to be validated, and sometimes you find a biomarker that you then cannot rely upon in the future. And by the way, your tumors uh, will mutate, uh, so you will have to keep looking at these issues. So the whole approach to the way we are addressing not just a drug discovery, but as Hakim says, medicine has got to change. But then I have had long conversations with, with policymakers and patient groups and other stakeholders around the world, and, and really it comes down to four key messages. This is not going to be quick. That's not necessarily a message that anybody's really been prepared to share. Uh, it always sounds like it's around the corner just next year. It's not next year. Um, it's for the long foreseeable future. It's, this is not a small mountain to climb. Um, and in a way, that's been, I think, mo one of the most challenging pieces for patients is that they keep hearing about this and it never shows up. Um, that will be something that we need to address. And we also have, um, you know, this was actually, I wanted to share this quote from the New Yorker uh, after the Obama announcement around the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, the way the New Yorker put it was, excitement surrounding personalized medicine has outpaced the science. Yes. Um, and that's something we need to be very mindful of because there is fatigue that will and, and, and dare I mention last week, no, I will not. But um, the, the question is, is when people get fatigued or when they feel like they're not being, uh, it's not registering in practice what they hear in discussion, there is that, that conflict there that people will eventually figure this is hype. Um, this isn't hype, but it isn't quick. Um, it's also not about swapping a single treatment. This is systemic change. This isn't just, I get my drug discovery right and the drug works better than it did before. The whole of the system needs to change around it. That was never going to be a quick process. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, I know uh, Sue will talk about it from this, the perspective of NHS England. That is, again, no small task. It's not just changing the systems we have today. It's changing the training. It's training the education. And as a, you know, I've tried to talk with colleagues internally, um, we've changed the what we're doing in terms of research, we've changed a bit of the how we're doing it and when things might happen, and that obviously will change the who. So different entities will become involved at different processes of drug discovery, development, manufacture, and then the use of any treatments, including med tech, when it happens. And patients have to understand how that world will change for them. So we do need to talk about the data, and I'm not going to labor that one. The only thing I was going to throw out to you is it also has to be popularly acceptable to be using the data in the ways that we've been talking about. And that's no small issue, partially because most of the time when I talk, start talking about data, uh, with your general pu public, they kind of glaze really fast because they didn't want to talk about that banking thing. They don't, they, th yeah. that's like superfluous information. So how do we make it, how do we get the message across um, in a way that's going to engage people? And as much as I have, you know, and I'm sure everybody on the panel is going to, you know, Lab 23 and me, hmm, I, 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 don't, I don't know how I feel about it, very conflicted. One thing I feel is really great about them is they've got a partnership with Superdrug. I mean, that is, if you want to popularize genomics and understanding about these issues, they've got a partnership with Superdrug. That is, you know, we've got to make the most of these opportunities. That's going to be carrying things through. And then the final thing, and this will not surprise you coming out of my mouth, this may not be cheap, uh, at least in the short run. Um, these, anytime you're changing a system in the level I'm describing or doing things that differently, this is going to have experimentation. Can you afford it? Can you afford not to do it? Um, and that is going to involve an investment and a stability in public finances and in private finances that we still need to, to assure. But um, I, I will shut up there and let Sue correct everything I just got wrong. <laughs> so. I wouldn't, of course, dream of doing that. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Sue Hill, the Chief Scientific Officer for NHS England. I have a broad portfolio, but... Uh, 
in, in relation today, I'm a senior responsible officer for genomics and have been leading the NHS contribution to the 100,000 Genomes Project, but also planning the legacy. And some of you who followed the personalised medicine uh, agenda within NHS England that encompasses precision medicine and stratified medicine, you'll know that I led uh, the NHS England's personalised medicine strategy uh, that was published at NHS Expo. And that set out uh, a high level set of aspirations for the next 10 years for the NHS and recognised within that strategy we had to encompass the whole of the functional genomics pathway. So from DNA and, and different ways in which we may look at DNA, right from simple genotyping up to more uh, to whole genome sequencing, but through transcriptomics, epigenetics, proteomics and met metabolomics. And it's only if we look at this all together and use that uh, uh, and integrate it with other diagnostics and other clean, clinical phenotypic data, are we really truly going to be able to personalise uh, treatments and interventions <coughs> for the future? But that will also drive us to be able to detect disease earlier on the basis of underlying cause, um, make a more precise diagnosis and to really help us in our preventative and predictive type of health strategies. But it also recognised within that is we need to create a new relationship with patients. Now, the NHS is in a unique position because we have, as you've already heard from Hackham, we have longitudinal health records available on all of our 55 million citizens. We have a unique identifier in the NHS number. Our challenge has been we haven't always put that together in a meaningful way, uh, let alone how we get it out and integrated from within 600 different systems systems within an individual hospital institution. But we do have cutting edge diagnostics. We have really a state of the art genomic laboratories in the NHS that are, uh, they don't have elsewhere in the world. We have molecular uh, pathology and, and other elements that are, are critical to thinking about a personalized or precision medicine service. We just don't bring them together. And that's, that's the challenge. What we do have through the NHS contribution to the 100,000 Genomes Project is the fact that we've created, this is from NHS England, 13 genomic medicine centres. Within those genomic medicine centres, they're operating across a population of 3 to 5 million. We've created through that network 13 data hubs that are pulling data. So for one individual patient, with rare disease that might be uh, participating, data may have to be pulled from 600 different standalone systems. And we know one organization when that was indeed true. But if you think about the multiplicity of patients across rare disease and cancer that are taking part, this is a huge data co collection, collation, QA, and submission challenge. And we've got part of that infrastructure uh, created, as well as thinking about how we embrace the concept of industrialization, consolidation, standardization for better outcomes and reduction in variability. Um, and what is wrapped around that is thinking about how we look at efficiency, effectiveness, mm -hmm. and uh, value for money as we, we move into the NHS uh, for the future. What we've learned through the 100,000 Genomes Project, though, with a, a database that's been created by Genomics England, it is possible to take patient identifiable data at a point that only clinicians can see that who are responsible for the care of those patients, but eventually de identify that data relating to that clinical episode with the informed consent of patients and then into that database also pull longitudinal records from HAIRS and other databases and use that data in a pre-competitive industry space, in an enhanced clinical interpretation space to drive research questions 
and for training purposes, as well as ensuring that individuals in the NHS don't start to make a diagnosis that where pathogenic significance is unknown on the basis of N equals 1, i.e. themselves, without comparing that uh, with others. So why is it that NHS is England is interested? And then I'll set what I think might be helpful in terms of us having a conversation is we're interested because we spend £15 billion a year on drugs in the NHS, and that cost is rising. We spend eight to 10 billion on diagnostics in the NHS, and we don't bring the two together. To drive either better outcomes for our patients, reduce inequalities, or indeed personalized treatments and other interventions. Because <laughs> we know from the 100,000 Genomes Project, some of the interventions are basically simple dietary uh, supplementation. What we know in terms of um, introducing a systematic approach in the NHS for personalised medicine for the future is integration and collaboration is going to be critical. One integration in terms of clinicians working with academics, working with industry, working with patients so they understand what is happening and what some of the difficult decisions that may need to be made, but also learning from international collaborations. And it's only if we can get that to work and recognise that as part of routine care, we collect an enormous amount of information that isn't available for industry or for research without a separate parallel set of, of studies and interventions. And we could really get this right, I think, for the very first time. As I often say, we don't have a plan B. This is it. But we need your help. And I would ask you how we could systematically get your involvement in this agenda and make sure we design something for the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Um, as you can see, I'm a very august panel. So our first question was, how close are we to the promised land um, uh, Hakeem, perhaps you could take this. Now, you phrase it always as you know, put the promised land as every patient, a research patient in the north. How close are you truly to that? You know, all those secondary hospitals as well. So, yesterday, um, for those of you who are here, Sir John Bell said that it's normally 20 years when you start the clock, when you start something like stratified medicine, which he was a pioneer of. Uh, and that gave us three years, he said, to where we might actually have that as something that is more mainstream. I tend to lean towards um, what Ginny said, and to, this is going to be a much longer process. Um, and it's not the science that's going to mm. hold us back, and it's not the, the ability of the infrastructure to be able to deliver that's going to hold back. It's going to be the people and processes that we need to integrate into mainstream care, uh, and it's going to be pro programs like the 100,000 Genome Project, which is actually taking apart these care pathways and putting them back together again mm. in a way that we can deliver that. So I'd like to think it's around the corner, and there are a few great examples of products coming through where it is, but what we need is more and more engagement with companies like the ones in the room to be able to slowly, over time, change the system towards an environment that is more conducive to working with it. But just to pin you down there, Hakeem, um, you know, in the north, how close are you to every patient or research patient? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, in terms of, if we take one project that we've been doing, Precision Medicine, and the company's actually in the room, uh, Congenica, it's a software platform that is used to basically provide data analytics and data visualisation of some of the information coming out of the 100,000 Genomes project. If we use it, the technology is an example of, if patients are research patients, we want them all to be working with the same sorts of platforms, the same mm -hmm. sorts of technologies. What we did is work with that company to identify the right pilot site to get the information and get the technology piloted and tested so that the NHS was happy with it. But at the same time, minimise the amount of not invented here syndrome that you often get within the NHS by exposing that company and that technology to a number of our other hospitals. The pilot went on for about eight months, uh, and then after those eight months, the company was able to contract with four other teaching hospitals. So that's five hospitals in a matter of a few months, going from one to five. Those sorts of systems will help us get to the point where every patient is a research patient because we're actually get, providing a way of disseminating the technology and disseminating the processes. But to pin me down on a date, a time frame, can't answer that. 
Okay, great. Uh, Sue, well, you, you clearly have a, a good sense of how close we are to the promised land and the NHS. I mean, what's your sense? How are we, how are we doing and how do you feel we compare with the, you know, the rest of the world? So, well, in terms of the rest of the world, in, in genomics, we know that the 100,000 Genomes Project is, is truly uh, world-leading because it is bringing data together from routine care and putting that uh, together with whole genome sequencing. And that isn't, in most other countries, the initiatives are all research-based. And I think if you want to mainstream <coughs> something, it's got to be done as part of routine care. Mm -hmm. So we are on a journey, and the, as part of the spending review commitments, there was an expectation that NHS England would procure whole genome sequence capacity for the NHS from April 18. We're in the process of starting that. And what came with the SR commitments was also um, the continued evolution of the Genomics England data base and data centre to become a genomics uh, knowledge base uh, for uh, England, but certainly the UK. And so we're working on genomic information in the future all flowing into that database along with other other um, phenotypic information. So that's really going to drive enhanced clinical interpretation and research in that area. I think in terms of if we look across the spectrum of those peers, we, we know that we're not there with some of the other types of, of uh, research or partnerships with industry around clinical trials, for example. Mm. But what I can say is we're definitely having that conversation now about how that would operate. And we're also <coughs> trying, will be focusing on a small number of exemplar pathways from 17, 18 onwards, where we can start to test the hypothesis in a way that we get some exemplars, we learn the lessons, and then we can develop an enabling framework that enables it to be uh, uh, applied. So we've got to go through this in a very systematic and structured way and make sure that there aren't the, uh, the perverse incentives that underpin uh, implementation, such as commissioning. Because if we really want to make this a re reality, then we've got to make sure that um, we've got nothing that stops uh, this happening. And therefore, what we, you, we create is a postcode lottery for eligible <coughs> patients. So this is a complex issue, but it's one that's being discussed at the highest levels of the NHS. Great. I was going to pause there and bring it open to the, the, the floor. Um, you know, you guys are out there in the real world. You see lots of other com uh, countries, I imagine, some of you. How do you feel we're doing? I mean, does anyone have a strong point of view? <coughs> Thanks. I I'm Martin Gibson, and uh, I work in Manchester, so some of what Hakim says is, uh, is uh, relevant. But <coughs> I really want to talk from the national perspective, which I think is the question you're asking. Hmm. And we have, some, nobody's mentioned it, but we have the National Institute for Healthcare Research, which is uh, a unique offering. Um, and I remember when we set this up in around about 2006 for the, whole, for the whole system, the ambition set at the time was to get about 0.5% of the population enrolled in clinical trials. Uh, we're now over 1%, so we're well beyond what we said we were going to do. And the other ambition was to try and uh, work more closely with the life sciences industry. Uh, and we've done extraordinarily well at that. Um, uh, in fact, we've completely reversed the downward trend in clinical trials uh, that was happening in the UK. Uh, and are now on a par with Germany, which you know, we would never have thought we would have achieved. Um, and then a plug for the north of England, uh, because Hacking didn't say it, is that we do better than anyone else than doing just that. So uh, place your trials with us. <laughs> 
Okay, yes, I wonder if I might ju just comment on that. What, what, we've, what we've noticed is uh, that through the 100,000 Genomes Project and the participation of, of, of uh, the NHS in this, in certain centres, uh, the recruitment to NIHR portfolio studies has gone up because uh, they've realised that there are other studies that they are eligible for. So we're starting to see the benefits of thinking about mm -hmm. research and, and the research infrastructure that is wrapped around the NHS and, and academia in, in a way that we, we haven't done to date. That's early, you know, it's, it's, it's an early indication, but it's definitely in the right direction to build upon the excellent work that NIHR has done to date. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank you for reminding us about NIHR, and it's something that I can uh, wholeheartedly agree, particularly on the clinical trials piece. Uh, we get these questions a lot, so is it really true, do you think, that the clinical trials numbers are going up? Yes, I can say that hand on heart, across the board, even phase threes. Um, so uh, we are in a good place, and I'd like to see that continue. I think what's been really helpful about NIHR and some of the, the examples that, that Sue's been describing. Um, is it shows that part of the challenge is just getting people together to really discuss what do you what do you need to get this work done? Um, how do you get this achieved in a way that means that people can um, not presume that they know what the answer is, but they can actually discuss it directly, and NIHR has been hugely effective at that. I would also point out another group that we haven't talked about that I should have flagged, which is, of course, the catapults, uh, Innovate UK's catapults, the Precision Medicine catapult we haven't mentioned, uh, we should mention, uh, and also the drug discovery uh, catapult that's now going to also be launching in the Manchester area. So you guys have got quite a lot of uh, things going on up there. And of course, your exemplar, best one probably to date that most people know is the Salford Lung Study um, that GSK has, has been investing in. So all, all to just confirm, you know, this is something that we should have been flagging up. But there are very good reasons why the UK has an opportunity, uh, as people have described, to really um, advance on the global stage for these work, for, the, for this type of work. I think the, the only other point, um, just to add on what the, the junior said, I think there's a, um, uh, the engagement between industry, uh, academia and the healthcare system I think has improved significantly. But I do think there's, there's huge opportunities to go faster, we can do more. Um, and there's a general interest from industry to engage um, in a far more uh, constructive way, um, certainly from the medtech industry, that is absolutely there. Um, I think the big challenge for us then is actually to get that to the point where we're actually talking about adoption. So we move from discovery into translation yeah. and through to adoption. And I do think that adoption piece is where we start to hit the buffers. So to, to go back to your original question, when do we get to the point where precision medicine isn't something else, it's just the way that we do stuff. You know, you're talking 2030, 2035 is the kind of horizon. I, you know, in preparation for this, I read a Frost and Sullivan report that actually says not in these words, but Star Trek's Scotty's tricorder will be um, in common use before we actually have precision medicine. <laughs> so that's a, so that's a, but that's a technology that's relatively easy to adopt, and that's why I think that adoption piece will come first because it's a relatively easy piece of technology to adopt. We're actually talking here about changing the whole system yeah. and the way that healthcare is actually delivered, which is a huge challenge. Um, if you map, I know because again we've done it. If you map an oncology pathway, you'll fill a wall. We're actually talking about now having an oncology pathway for individual patients mm -hmm. that you somehow need to map and manage. That's a hugely complex task. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we've got to try and get our head around. Great. Thank you. Picking up on something that you said, Sue, earlier about actually starting to link some of this together, and the NIHR is a key part of this, but we've also got the MRC pathology notes. Yep. Um, NHR have the Diagnostic Evidence Collaboratives, we've got the two Precision Medicine Catapults, we've got NHS England, we've got UK Biobank. There's a huge amount of infrastructure that is there to support companies deliver precision medicine. Mm. But I think we do need to work out how it all fits together mm -hmm. for an individual company or for an individual technology coming in. Mm. Because many of the companies that we work with look at all of that and think, this is amazing, but where do I start? Mm. Yeah. And so as part of what we're doing, we need to look at how that all fits together. And to, um, to Martin's point around the trials, yeah, the North is delivering more clinical trials than any other region in the country. And one of the reasons why is we're starting to actually be able to bring some of it together around individual care pathways and look at what we've got in a way that regions haven't really, and clusters haven't really done before. Yeah. And that's a, the first step in the journey. Got you. Okay. Any other... Uh, 
Thank you. I'm sure we all share the frustration you express about the complexity of the number of systems that are in the infrastructure that have to be integrated. But my frustration is the multiplicity of different uh, initiatives that are going on in England and in Wales and elsewhere. You know, last week I was chairing a meeting where the people from Southampton were showing us what they're doing with their new informatics centre. <coughs> Unbelievably good. We've got the sale database in Wales linking up that way. But isn't it time we had some central direction? I mean, I know that's not the way Britain organises democracy, but isn't it time that there was leadership which simply said, look, folks, with all of those catapults, with all of these different systems, this is what you're going to do. And we then have a single approach to it, recognising different diseases and so on. That's my first point. Second, when I was interviewing Sir John yesterday, I mentioned the conversation I'd had with... Uh, Francis Collins over his million um, pe pe people genome project and the fact that he mentioned that there were many databases now around the world where there were over 100,000 genome sequences, not all linked to patient databases of course, but who's going to curate those? They're all over the place. So could Britain be the curator of all of these genome, epigenome databases? I'll just take the first point there. I think we've got to a point now where we've got so much infrastructure that's been invested in by the likes of Wellcome and MRC that you're absolutely right, we need to bring that together. There is a forum that does that, and that's OSCAR, the Office for Strategic Health Research, which Sir John Bell chairs, I believe. Uh, and that is an environment where each of the different funding bodies is com are coming together. But I don't think it's yet got the teeth to then deliver a joined-up strategy across everyone. Uh, and that's an opportunity, I think, for the UK to come together and deliver a single precision, personalised, stratified, whatever we end up calling it, strategy, because we've got all the moving parts. So you want to come in? So um, as part of moving towards paperless 2020 in the NHS, the National Information Board has established a number of work streams which will essentially determine what uh, becomes part of the data services platform within NHS Digital. And there's a huge work programme in NHS Digital, including, for example, uh, the aspiration to develop a, a faculty of clinical informatics and on sort of digital behaviours. Uh, and what we have to recognise as we go forward, that there will be a number of different health apps that have been accredited for use that will need to capture that data, that for the NHS, the development of NHS Digital is critical in terms of what can be pulled and populates the, the data services platform with all its plugins, but recognising that we're never going to be able to specify the type of data that needs to be able to be pulled in, into that. And with Matthew Swindells, the, the new um, executive director of informatics in NHS England, you'll be aware that they just recently announced some global digital health partners to really take um, health data into uh, you know, the, the 2020s. Uh, and that's really looking at in innovative solutions uh, around multiplicity of sources of data. But I think part of the, the, the challenge and the opportunity we've got is how we use data from routine care rather than specific um, separately funded clinical trials or <coughs> research trials. How do we use that to drive the research agenda? So it will need both the research data infrastructure and the NHS to work together with all the different uh, uh, analytical platforms. And within NHS um, <coughs> Digital, they have a whole work stream around analytical platforms and the, the development of analytical tools that could be applicable uh, on a raft of data. And that includes artificial intelligence for mining imaging or pathology data. So, so I just want to pick up on something there, because you're right that in terms of the activity data is going to be on various different systems, and there's no way that we can mandate who, what, how that activity data is captured. But if you look at Sweden and Belgium, they've committed to national outcome data programs to allow them to manage variation in care. And if you look across the world, the bit of data that's really missing, it's not treatment and it's not genomics, it's the outcomes. You know, we have a transparency agenda. It's been bogged down for at least two governments in, in talking and not doing. 
That is an area where we could mandate, and it would do patients a lot of good now in variation management. What's the NHS doing on that? Well, I think we recognise that we need to do that. I think the second thing is we recognise that have, if you bring all your diagnostic data together with all your, your deep clinical, clinical phenotypic data, then you still need to be able to apply drugs and intervention mm -hmm. databases. I think it recognises that we need to collect the outcome data, and it is being done in some diseases, but not systematically. That is recognised as something that needs to be done, but it's not there yet. Um, and I think part of creating the infrastructure is making sure, for example, it's, it's no use for industry or academia to have a bunch of data, but it's not collected to the same data standards across the, uh, across the UK, because otherwise <coughs> it's, you know, you've got so much signal to noise ratio, you don't know what's right and they're your, therefore the default position will be back to, to clinical trials and other ways of doing it. So we've got to establish the data standards and have that, that right and then establish the secondary uses of data and what, that's, that, what that can be used for. And is this about motivating the NHS or is it about motivating communities of patients and clinicians and I, potentially pharma and industry partners within individual diseases? Would we get further by thinking about this as a sort of ovarian cancer and dyslipidemia problem, or should we be thinking about this as a national problem? Well, it is a national problem. I think what we've got to get to in cancer is a, is a defined data set, and I think we're almost there with an evolution of COSD, a, a national data set for cancer, mm. irrespective. So there's a core for all cancers, and then something that might be specific, if, if appropriate, for ovarian or testicular or whatever cancer you are looking for. At, and I think we're, we're getting there. We're getting there the same type of approach for rare and other non-communicable diseases. So you, you have a standard <coughs> set of fields that we know that needs to be populated or, or pulled uh, to, towards. Can, can I jump in? Because actually it's, it's something that we're already working on. I mean, this is the real world evidence challenge that um, we already have a lot of partnerships on as well. Um, we here in the UK with NHS and, and with others, but also under the Innovative Medicines Initiative, under the Get Real program. I mean, this is a really key area. And uh, I, th I think, you know, I'd, I'd almost go back to your first slide, Pierce, which is if you think biomarkers are tricky when you're trying to do the discovery part of things, try and figure out biomarkers for outcomes, particularly in some disease areas where you have a lot of intervailing variables that will need to be sorted out in the system. So it's absolutely the agenda, mm. and it's going to be, it's, it, it's the way we're all going. It's the way we're all going. But um, we could do with some clever ideas in this space. So maybe some dedicated research. I mean, the IMI project is but one thing. There is some core research that maybe needs to be thought through. And again, MRC has done a fabulous job on a lot of the genomics agenda. I think they are very uh, interested in real world evidence. We've had uh, a number of occasions for uh, exchange with, with MRC and others on this piece. I mean, absolutely. Fully agree that this is the agenda, but this is no. This Copy. again, if I thought the one mountain was bad, that that's really scary. Well, I'm just I'm conscious we only got about ten minutes more, and I wondered if we could shift to a sort of. You know, we feels like indirectly we've covered a much of the you know, where we are and what the barriers are. You know, why don't we sort of start talking about what we need to deliver, and especially what I'd love. You know, keep it practical and simple ideas that are fast. Yes, ideas from the floor and simple things we can do to get there faster. I'd like to follow up on what Ginny just said, is that uh, I agree, um, getting the right outcome measures is the right, important thing. Um, coming from a patient charity, um, one of the things that is striking is the disconnect between um, diagnostics um, that uh, are perceived to be important and what actually matters to the patient. So why can't we ask the patients what they want um, and then get diagnostics to measure that. Now, I'll give you one example very briefly. Mm. Um, uh, in cystic fibrosis, one of the problems is pulmonary exacerbations. That is measured by FEV1, so um, a, a measure of lung function. And yet you talk to a patient with uh, CF, they will know a week before their FEV1 drops that they are falling ill. And it's things like, it takes me twice as long to get dressed in the morning. My, um, I, I just... I can't go to work. 
And so, something simple like an activity monitor, if it was accepted, um, could potentially help. And that is a clear outcome, but it's way, you know, you have to think laterally about this Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely, that's outcome validation, and that's a, 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 as poorly funded in many ways as biomarker validation. Mm. Yeah, and the smartphone captures it for you. Love the idea. Any other ideas? Things that we could do that would move the needle fast? Yes? Um, just, well, two things. Really. One, I want to wholeheartedly agree with what the last um, questioner said. I think that too often we are using um, measurable surrogates for what we actually care about, which is patient benefit. Uh, and the second point I just wanted to make is that I think um, going back to the fact that we have centralised opportunities in the UK through NIHR, NHS and all of the rest of centralised mechanisms, uh, we could use that to take a lead in working with um, the life sciences industry where a lot of the money for doing fundamental biomarker research comes from uh, to ensure that we've got some red lines around what data is openware, open source to everybody, useful for everybody to use in their research going forward and what data you can draw a little line around and say this might give us a bit of competitive edge over the, our parallel competitors in this space and we're not going to publish on this or we're not going to let it out just yet because it might you know move us forward a little bit and i have direct experience of that it's very very unhealthy and it can mean that you know particularly in areas of of uh, disease research that are really novel that um, things just don't move along as quickly as they could do, and they don't, ref you know, the progress doesn't reflect the knowledge that is sitting within the industry and within academic researchers whose hands are tied because they're working in a funded partnership with industry. And I'm not knocking industry; I'm just saying we need to get rid of the nervousness that they have around that because mm. they need to realise it's helpful. It moves the plot along, and I think our centralised mechanisms could help in setting up some behaviour sets that we could adopt for this. <coughs> Coming back to your point uh, earlier, Piers, around um, should this be top-down or bottom-up from a disease area, and to the point on outcomes and, and the good example from uh, the floor, it, it's going to have to meet in the middle, and we're going to have to be driven by communities of care. And communities of care can be with patient groups, it can be with health economies. A great example from Manchester is they've now got a devolved health budget. They're going to have to look at the way that care is provided in their community in a completely different way with a cap budget and they're going to be looking for innovative solutions whether they be precision or otherwise. What we've been doing in the north is starting to build communities of care with citizens not just patients actually the people that may become <coughs> patients in the future to understand how they want to engage with the health economy with particular care pathways so that we can start to build the solutions that are going to be fit for purpose down the line. That may include bringing in outside parties that wouldn't normally come to a conference like this, which might be other civic organisations like the fire service and the police service, who actually have far more interaction with citizens and patients than often the, the NHS and the care providers do. And how do you build a system, <coughs> a civic system, whereby the whole health community focuses around the patient, the citizen needs? And so that's a project we've got going on at the moment across the north of England. It's been funded by the Department of Health, Connected Health Cities, where we're taking two care pathways per city and bringing all the right people to have that conversation. But it will only really become consistent and mainstream if it can join with top-down strategies from central government and organisations like NHS England. Other people, people want to comment on the idea? I, I, I think there's a really interesting discussion here just in terms of engagement with the population, with citizens. Um, and it goes beyond access to data. Because it actually goes to the point then, well, actually, what, what's the end result of this? And it'll be a dialogue with an individual who has a condition who will be told that they, they will have a certain type of treatment. And that treatment, we think, will be specific to them. But they may want something else, completely different. And that dialogue becomes a very unique dialogue. And is the population ready for that discussion? And are clinicians ready to have that discussion with those individuals? I think it's a really complex area. You know, I, my mum... Um, survived breast cancer 10 years ago, her words to me were, I want them to throw the kitchen sink at me. <laughs> Quite literally. And they did throw the kitchen sink at her, and 10 years on, she's still here. We have no clue whether that was the right treatment for her or not. Yeah? It might have done her more harm than good. We just don't know. But if she's around in 20 years' time, she will still say the same thing, unless somebody educates her differently, that there's a better way to decide what care you get. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a really complex discussion here to be had in terms of what do we, how do we get the data, how do we get the data in a meaningful way, but then actually how do we have a conversation about how do we use that and how do we educate the population in terms of what we do do with that. One of the things we've been doing just um, to that is running citizen juries 
where we actually put the use of data on trial. So it's a two, three day exercise where we bring in the public, um, present experts for and against the case, uh, and they sit on a jury and vote against the use or misuse of that information. And that data is now being published through the Fire Institute. So you can go and look at citizen juries on health data and actually see how the public is viewing this directly. I think, Piers, one of the, we, we realise we're going to have to focus on a small number of areas where, where either we've got variation or poor outcomes or we're not taking a population-based approach. And two, two areas are familial hypercholesteremia, where we, we still have significant mortality in the under 50s because we're not doing cascade testing or genotyping. So that will be something we'll definitely be pushing from the centre, and that's very much going to be reliant on CCG commissioning. So it gives us a new um, a way of thinking about having a systematic approach to the involvement of CCG commissioners in this involving uh, a genotype. The second is warfarin therapy. We know mm -hmm. one in 15 hospital episodes are associated with adverse drug reactions. Most of those are around warfarin therapy. Even when we know there's an algorithm that's, uh, uh, that uh, involves a raft of data, but also um, genotypic data, we're not doing that systematically. Mm -hmm. The savings for the system could be huge if we tackle this. We're starting in two areas, one in, one in the northwest and one in the northeast, and then we'll use that as a pilot to roll out across the rest of the country. And I think from a top-down approach, we'll work with areas where we know the evidence is good, we've got the evidence to, to tackle those three gaps in the NHS, and then we can look at this in terms of how we get the data to work, we get the incentives to work and we get the diagnostics and the personalised medicine. The other approach we're looking at at the moment is we're looking at the top 20 drug spends in the NHS and saying, can we do that differently? And involving patients in that discussion about the, the use of diagnostics and about some of the treatment decisions uh, that, that are made. So, and that will act as sort of exemplars uh, for the rest of care. And unless we, we do it like that, there will constantly be a set of um, just ad hoc mm. developments across the NHS. Mm. Piers, can I just quickly answer that question that came from the back around the open science piece? Because we yes. don't want to leave it hanging. Because it really kind of comes to the point of how we're going to continue this work. Um, so maybe a good ending uh, comment for me, because I know we're running up to time. Um, the, I would say, Given where we come from, I mean, it just cast your mind back 10 years ago, how companies were co working in that time frame and how they worked with R&D. Bring forward today where you have so many joint partnerships, not just the IMI work, but across the board bilateral arena, uh, arrangements, working with different partnerships. We've pushed the barriers, I think, quite a lot on what's pre-competitive. Uh, if you heard Chaz Bunter last night, then you heard about the Structural Genomics Consortium. There's a lot of examples like this. So I actually think that this conversation will continue, and as far as we can identify, I think a lot of target validation right now already is considered pre-competitive. We can push these questions forward. It, it, is, it does take people sometimes to step back and have the conversation, what, we, what are we really worried about here? Um, and I would just say you know, that that is something that we could maybe take as a, a real advantage here in the UK to lead that conversation. Mm. And that sounds like a very good place to wrap up. Thank you very much for your excellent contributions. Thank you for your questions. Um, best of luck. Let's make it happen here. Thank you.